You want to escape. You need to blow it back open. There's dynamite in the arsenal. Ah, and a handle to trigger it somewhere in the excavation site. Get them, and you can make it out. Oh, shit! That thing, it's coming for me. Here, take this. Finish me off, please. I want to die in the hands of a broader soldier, not that monster. There's ammo in the pantry. Get if you're a fan of horror games, then the Amnesia series, created by Frictional Games, is a name that should be overly familiar to you. But if you are unaware, the first game in the series, Amnesia The Dark Descent, can be directly attributed to the boon of horror games we've had as of late, inspirational in its storytelling and design, whose contributions to the genre can be seen in the DNA such as in games such as Outlast, Visage, and Layers of Fear. Stripping the ability for players to fight back against monsters and the horrors within the walls of Brennenburg Castle was monumental in the shift of design change, as horror games were more regulated to games such as Resident Evil or Silent Hill, both becoming more action-focused in the late 2000s and early 2010s. Frictional released games like Amnesia Rebirth and Soma, while the Chinese room headed up the creation of Amnesia, a machine for pigs. But outside of Soma for completely different different reasons, none of these titles were able to reach the heights and fervor that the Dark Descent did. I believe there's also an aspect of it hitting at the time when YouTube was really starting to blow up as well, and you see a bunch of horror channels pump this game like it's going out of style, and rightfully so. So when Amnesia the Bunker released in early 2023, I had mixed expectations. However, I can happily say that the Bunker not only met expectations, but exceeded them in almost every way possible. A riveting, tense experience, where the true horror stems from one simple mechanic, that is procedural world creation. But enough of this intro, let's dive on into Amnesia the Bunker. If you enjoy content like this, consider subscribing to the channel. We've been on a true horror kick lately, but if you have any other games you want to dive into, let me know in the comments down below. But without further delay, let's get into why I'm the bunker is so damn good. Since the dawn of man, humans have been warring with each other and by far one of the most gruesome is World War I, a war not often talked about at least here in the United States, due mainly to the fact that we as a country are so self-centered and given our infinitesimal involvement, there's not too many pieces of media focused on this topic coming from the states. I think that's why a game like Battlefield 1 was so popular and frankly as interesting as it was. Amnesia Rebirth also took place in this time period, but as we will discuss in a future video, Rebirth did not lean into the setting nearly as much as the bunker does. We open with our main protagonist is Henri, as an assault on the trench is taking place from the German line. Navigating through the trench, we are introduced to a number of mechanics we will be contending with further in the game. The use of your gun, the manipulation of objects in the world, grenades and the like. After being gassed by the Germans, Henri is saved by his friend Lambert, and the scene fades. Again opening it with Henri finding Lambert trapped in a pit, saving him by putting water from a nearby puddle in the crater into his mouth and carries him off, only to be caught out in no man's land as the Germans begin shooting on their position. The scene fades again, looking grim, and we wake up in the bunker, and the infirmary lights out, with only a zipline flashlight nearby. Now off the rip, I love this little light, and its implementation here in the bunker and how it interacts with the systems we will, we will discuss here in the future, but off the rip from the sound design to the animation of ripping the cord as a tiny beam of safety kicks on is both comforty and anxiety inducing, all at the same time. Making our way into the cafeteria, we see claw marks on the walls, blood littering the hallways, all leading to a soldier crying for help mangled by some unseen force. He tells Henri that the officers have abandoned them in the tunnels, blowing the entrance behind them to trap the beast that lurks within the bunker inside and asks that you take his revolver and end his life, not wanting to be a meal to the beast, with more ammo conveniently located in the pantry. You know, it's right next to the tomatoes. Upon grabbing the single round, we turn to fulfill the soldier's last wish, and as we aim, we watch as he disappears, the growls and howls of the beast following his screams and obvious death. Bolting back through the dark corridors, Henri makes it to the admin room, locking the doors behind him. This is now our only safe sanctuary here in the bunker, and this is also where the game and tunnels of it begin to open up, 
and we begin to look for a way out. It is here that we introduce the systems at play here in the bunker, of which there are many. You are given a goal, that being find dynamite in the detonator, to blow open the tunnel and escape, all while avoiding the beasts and thus avoiding death. You make your way through multiple wings of the bunker, you know, the prison, barracks, armory, and maintenance area, locating items, codes, notes, pictures, and resources, all to help you with the final goal of escaping. While the layout of the bunker will always be the same, the items within are not, changing with every playthrough, and I do mean everything. Key items such as the wrench, ammo, health, grenades, and fuel are all procedurally randomized, making each new venture into the bunker a different experience than the last. Not only are items randomized, but passcodes and locker combinations are as well, meaning that there is no clear-cut guide to follow to cheese your way through the bunker, forcing the player to play it out, locating the codes, and navigating the bunker every single time. This randomization does wonders to ensure that the player is forced to explore every nook and cranny of the bunker in order to survive it. This also forces the tension in each playthrough as well. Just because you found fuel in a certain area in the last run doesn't mean it will be there again. This also negates the use of videos, walkthroughs, or your buddy walking you through where items are, fostering the feeling, again, of being alone, much like Henri. With passcodes and locker combinations being randomized as well, means you must find the dog tags for these with these codes every time. This change up in item placements and codes is the biggest differentiator that the bunker has, and for me, this really works. Along with that, we also have an inventory system a la Resident Evil, with you only be able to hold a few items at a time, before having to store them in a safe box. Unlike Resident Evil, however, your item box is also severely limited as well, meaning that you're unable to pack rat items, and if you're a pro gamer like myself, you'll find this filling up fast, in my case with healing items and crafting materials for more healing items. It's a delicate balance of item management that is lost in even other survival horror games where you can store an infinite amount of items for any reason, for any just-in-case moment that may prop up. I've been through this game two and a half times now, gathering footage, and every time there is a new set of tension when I scrounge up supplies, while avoiding contact with the beast at all cost, which is the other main component of the bunker. beast a four-legged demon that stalks the bunker, searching for food, and in this case, that would be you. I have discussed in length the power of the ever-looming threat in horror games, referring back to my Resident Evil 2 video with the power of Mr. X, as well as these small bits of Nemesis where he actually chases you around. While there is tension in the cannon fodder enemies, an all-new sense of dread is introduced when you have an unkillable death machine stalking around, whose sole purpose is to ruin your day. Unlike Mr. X, however, the beast in the bunker can be anywhere, crawling out of holes that it is far too large or feasible to squeeze in, looming in the darkness and responding to your every move. While there are certain sequences where he's guaranteed to show up, like in the cafeteria or in the chapel, which is a horrifying scene, the monster can be almost anywhere in the bunker, responding to the slightest sound made door opening, footsteps taken, gunshots, or grenades. Sound plays a massive role in the bunker, as the amount of sound made by the player can lure the beast into your space. As you sneak your way through the halls, you can hear the beast clambering through the ducts above you, hear him lurking in the walls around you, even see his hand reach out of one of the many holes, feeling around for you, his prey. This constant game of cat and mouse is exhilarating, terrifying, and most of all, fun as hell. In gaming, including in many survival horror games, despite the odds, the player will invariably always end up the hunter. It is is the way of standard game design, ensuring that the player has a way of neutralizing a threat unless specifically designed not to, like in previous Amnesia games or Outlast. However, the player does have tools at their disposal to give them a chance to at least survive, and while unable to kill your hunter, you could buy yourself some time to get away. Upon reaching the admin room, you gather a note located by your generator, telling you that the beast hates light. So while you're having the generator running, the lights throughout the bunker can be turned on and off, keeping the monster at bay and less aggressive than if the lights are out. However, if you aren't watching your fuel timer, an item that takes up a slot in your inventory, the lights will go out and the beast will roam the hallways, ever hunting for you. All while it's a absolute pain in the ass to see. This happened to me quite a few times in most of my runs. At the beginning of the game, fuel is abundant as you haven't looted anything, and thus you're able to see and keep the monster pretty much docile. However, as you begin to make your way through the supplies and as they begin to run dry as you ever hunt for 
for more items to help you escape, you tend to find that you're threading the needle many times, creeping through pitch black darkness of the bunker, hunting for fuel in the pitch blackness for a brief respite from the darkness. Being caught in the dark is terrifying, especially when you're on the other side of the bunker, what feels like eons away from safety of your admin room. For more personal engagements, there are uses for all the supplies that you can use to keep you alive. Your pistol, for starters, will make him retreat back to his lair after just a couple shots, just for the low, low cost of two or three rounds of your ammo, which is minimal at best. And with the use of flares, molotovs, lighting gas, barrels found in the world, or using your fuel that you were saving for your generator to light on fire, you could push the beast back, allowing you to get away and keep on exploring. However, at the cost of precious resources, weighing the pros and cons of engaging, running, or hiding is a real choice here. If you burn a puddle of fuel or make a molotov in the heat of the moment, you can no longer put that in your generator. If you use all your ammo, not only will you have less rounds for the next engagement, but you may not be able to shoot that lock off the door if you happen to cross it. If you use a grenade, you've lost a valuable breaching method into locked rooms, and more terrifying of all, you may even shatter the light bulbs littering the hallway in the process, thrusting that specific area into darkness. So while there are ways to fight, the cost of them are great. So great, in fact, that it may have always been better just to run away in the first place. Your meds are another resource to juggle, as if you keep getting hit by the beast, you'll be using them a lot. If you take a hit from the beast or get gnawed on by one of the many rats in the bunker, you will lose health, causing a bleed, which in turn will attract the beast to your location, following the trail of your blood you leave in your wake. Outside of the beast, we also have the rats to contend with, who thrive on feasting on dead corpses. Now, there are ways to get around them as these guys are miserable fuckers who will just gnaw your feet off until you're dead. But again, you learn through a note that if you burn the bodies, the rats won't appear. Plus, it's always satisfying to actually hit rats with fire because, man, I like watching these things die. However, the rats do serve as another brilliant obstacle in your path in order to force the player to either find a way around or expend some resources or health in order to get around them. While it always seems to be a much easier time clearing the path, you may not have the ability to do so, having used your grenade to open a locked door or keep the beast away from you. This push and pull between both sets of dangers as well as just exploring really puts all of your resource strain to the max. Something which survival horror is really based off of and something that Amnesia the Bunker does brilliantly. And with this masterful push and pull of resource use in the bunker, the systems at work do a fantastic job at building your story of survival in this World War I hellscape. When first looking at the bunker, I found it interesting how a horror game could take place on a battlefield in one of the bloodiest wars in human history. The idea of Frictional giving you a gun and ways to fight back seems to be counterintuitive to their prior game's design philosophies, and I came in questioning how this could be a terrifying experience. But boy, was I wrong. Frictional wastes no time reminding you of the war going on above, giving the sense that even if you escape this prison, the outside world of the bunker is no better. The constant shelling, dust rattling free from the ceiling, the reverberations of the blast outside, all serve to remind the player that while all of this is going on, the war is as well. A beautiful touch while also, again, serving to build that fear in the player. However, the standout scene here by far, and that best encapsulates this feeling, is the emergence into the pillbox. Getting the code from a tag located in the pillbox, upon standing up, you are greeted to a crack of a rifle and a bullet colliding with the wall behind you. Sniper fire is trained on the bunker, and the first time this happens, I actually scream. While this is a small moment in a 4-6 to six hour experience, this shot left an impression on me. I never forgot it the rest of the game. That being that everything in this game is, can, and will kill you. If you stand too long, the sniper takes another shot, this time actually hitting its mark and sending you back to your last save. On a side note, I appreciate the fact that auto saves are not actually a thing here, forcing the player to manually save every time they reach the admin room or before a set piece moment, making death a true pain point in the bunker, something that harkens back to early Resident Evil games, which as we all know, I'm a big fan of. And while the admin room may be safe, be sure to lock that door behind you. At the time of writing this, Frictional just added an update, making the admin room not even a safe zone anymore, no matter what. Which, to be honest, sounds like too much from my poor heart. With the amount of interlocking systems at play here, there is a lot to make the bunker a joy to play through. And while the game tells you at the very beginning to experiment and try things to make your way through this world, I have to say that this is a very true statement. It is what makes the bunker a must play in my book. But what good are great systems without a story behind it? So let's lock the doors, cozy up into the admin room, and hop into the story that Frictional Games has told here in the bunker, and one which I truly, truly adore. <sighs> Thank you.
In frictional style of storytelling, there are two threads of this tale we need to explore. One of what we are actually doing in the events leading up to the current time. We're going to start with the player narrative, as it is literally what happens, and then delve into the text of the bunker, learning of the events leading up to the present in the game. So, let's begin. Picking up where we left off, Henri sees the map and sets off to locate the dynamite and detonator needed to reopen the exit to the bunker, as, with, as it has been blown by the officers in a fit of terror, in order to seal the beast inside. Fellow soul damn. Exploring the tunnel, Henri finds notes, letters, and journals, as well as pictures, exploring the world of the bunker and the events had it taken prior. Heading to the armory, we see the dynamite, but the door inside is locked with a code, which we head off to find. After locating the foreman's dog tag and unlocking our way into the officer's quarters, we find a radio repeating the code to the armory. Big nice. Heading back, we sneak our way through and grab the explosives and place into the tunnel. Now only the detonator is needed, and that has been taken into the excavated Roman tunnels found underneath the bunker. Taken by Soldat Toussaint Buffoy. I know, I butchered that. Finding a German officer locked up in the prison cells, Henri releases the lock, in which this poor bastard is taken by the beast, with a pair of bolt cutters and a bloody stool being all that remains. I do find it odd that a tool that he probably could have used to free himself in some sort of way, I mean, I've seen a ton of action movies, is just sitting in the cell, but hey, that seems like the French way of doing things. Using the bolt cutters, Henri enters the excavation site in his search to find the detonator. Emerging into the Roman runes, uncovered by the residents of the bunker before the game, we see war and twisted occlusions in the tunnel, that which are unnaturally eerily dark, with otherworldly crystals suspended in air as if hung from wires. The tone here is otherworldly, creepy, distorted, and wrong. In the echoes of the Roman structure, we hear the echoings of poetry being recited by the resident here. Upon entering the antechamber, we find a table with a save point, some notes, and most strange thing of all, a pair of plucked out eyeballs, including a missive from the man in the tunnel, Toussaint Buffoy. We learn through the notes that Toussaint was the first to enter the Roman ruins, and after returning began having nightmares, visions of beasts, horrific acts being committed, and these nightmares became intoxicating, slowly wearing on his mind and his psyche until the collapse of the tunnels. In which he writes that he had to pluck out his own eyeballs to see better in the darkness of the tunnels. Now fit in a state of insanity. Roaming below looking for bloodshed. We encounter him further past this point while we're having visions of ghosts roaming the tunnels. While a muttering Toussaint lurks somewhere in the darkness ready to blast us away. This fight was absolutely terrifying as the visibility of these tunnels even with a flashlight is slim to none with verses of poetry being spewed while also being the only true indicator as to where he might be lurking while you take aim to end his suffering. In the bunker you can find a gas mask which makes the visibility of these tunnels a lot better, muting out the ghostly apparitions. However, the sound is also severely dampened, making it much harder to locate him that way. This fight, while easy, is terrifying and by far one of the most visually intense and horrifying boss fights I've ever encountered in any survival horror game. You do have the option of letting him live, but is that really the better ending for this poor lost soul? Even knowing I had the choice, it never felt right to let him live because even though he attempts to murder us he's still a soldier a comrade who succumbed to the darkness released from the tunnels during their excavation we find the detonator in a smaller tunnel to climb through upon exiting it we find that this hole that we're in looks vaguely familiar to the one where we found lumbert at the very beginning cutscene of the game before we even entered the bunker with a note and a stuffed rabbit in the center. Reading the note, we learn of the fate of Lambert, alongside a few other notes. And with these as well as Henri's, we, being the only ones voice acted in this game, we can obviously tell that these are important. In these, we learn of their friendship, that they have been labeled as suspicious as being saboteurs of the bunker, and to prove themselves and their loyalty, one of the two were to be sent out on patrol into no man's land, a place beyond the wire, between the trenches, a notorious place in World War I where no man was set to return, as that area would be under the watchful eye of both both sides. That which we can see in both the intro cinematic when Henri is helping Lambert escape, as well as in the pillbox when the sniper takes a pot shot. Not wanting to do the patrol, Henri challenges Lambert to a game of chance. Breaking the game in his favor and Lambert gets sent out on patrol. Henri attempts to convince himself all is fine until days go by with no return. That brings us to the cutscene where we find Henri, who's gone out to find his friend, attempting to rescue him from the very same pit we're currently standing in, and feeding him water from the hole. In the note we learn that the water sliding down his throat had a strange sweet taste to it, and after the artillery shell that knocked the pair out, Lambert strangely got to his feet and carried his friend back to the bunker, despite being near death. He laments about a rabbit toy he bought for his son that was lost since his return 
return as he had taken it with him on the patrol. Hence its presence here in the hole after we return after the Toussaint event. As days go by, Lambert begins to have a strange itch, begins losing focus. It was filled with a newfound strength, beginning to feel ravenous with terrible thoughts, eventually attacking a fellow soldier in the bunker, and then the next night was worse, murdering two more officers and dragging them into the walls, through holes he burrowed himself. He began to hunt as many soldiers as possible, filled with hatred, finally transforming into the beast we've been contending with this entire adventure. It is truly a captivating moment in the bunker, knowing that Lambert, friend of our protagonist, Henri, was the beast all along, and it boggles the mind that Frictional would bury this all in the texts and diaries found in the world. And this is an honest testament to the game itself, as just on the pure gameplay front alone, this game already works on so many levels. But if you're a player who reads collectibles, finds lore, and dives into it, the payoff of what is actually going on is far greater than it seems on the surface again much like the rest of Frictional's representation of work, that which we will dive into in the near future, probably starting with Soma. Grabbing the rabbit and the detonator, Henri exits the Roman catacombs and blows the exit open only to find that the hole doesn't go out but goes down. Venturing further down, we find more Roman runes, more crystals opening into a vast chasm inside a chamber, an opening on the other side with the beast between us. We have two options here that can affect the ending, kill or escape. It seems fairly obvious what needs to be done here, but we can push to escape or we can attempt to murder the beast before leaving. And while through conventional means it would be easier said than done, Henri has an ace up his sleeve, one only available to an astute player who decides to read the lore. You can blast him away with grenades, shotgun shells, and pistol rounds, which will work after a while. However, if you've been playing the game like I have, there's not a lot of these to go around. However, we also have the rabbit doll, and knowing that Lumbert is the beast and the rabbit doll is for his son, maybe this thing can actually be of some use. We yeet it onto the walkway. The beast, Lambert, our friend, makes a beeline for the doll, looking at it before scooping it up and tucking it somewhere. Using this distraction, a well-placed grenade will destroy the bridge she's standing on, sending the creature to its death in the chasm below. Again, this is the only thing that really feels right to me, as would it truly be a better ending if we let our mutated friend live alone to starve or worse, exist until the end of time? Henri makes his way to the opening, beast long gone, and upon exiting, the hole is met with the outside air, lying in the trench before the alarm can be heard in the distance, Germans yelling in the background and artillery shells being fired once again. Henri has not escaped hell, it's just in a new form. This touch was beautifully crafted by the team at Frictional and had me truly thinking which existence was truly worse. In my head it seems obvious, but there is a case to be made that it may have been better to be lost in the bunker until the ultimate demise, rather than returning to the war that had not ceased since your entrance to the hell below. Amnesia the Bunker is honestly a masterclass in both systematic horror, emergent gameplay stories, as well as building a world that is wholly believable, even with this otherworldly beast in essence stalking the halls of the bunker. In all the notes we see, the resonance in the world become fleshed out, recounting the tales leading up to the current events. The notes are split into who wrote them, a nice touch for those who want to keep track of who does what in the backstory of the bunker. We learn more of the war, how the French were being battered, and the toll it has taken on the men. Deserters in the group looking to sabotage the bunker itself, as well as the final excavation of the ruins below, leading to the mystical horrors that would befall them to their death. After the tunnels were opened, we begin to see members of the bunker begin to lose their minds, succumbing to dark thoughts, mistrust all over the group, until the creation of Lambert into the beast, in which the officers, the leaders of the group, decided to seal the bunker behind them as they made their escape, abandoning their fellow soldiers, those who fought beside them and under them, to their ultimate fates. It is a lot to digest here, and if you're looking to play through this game again or for the first time, I highly recommend reading and listening to every note, examining every picture, and drinking in the entire experience. The Bunker is a masterclass in survival horror, from a gameplay to a systems front working here, as well as the blending of a well-crafted backstory and narrative for those who are willing to dig for those answers. This is a game that in my eyes is an instant classic in the survival horror genre, and if there is a direction Frictional wants to head down for a bit, I'm in full support of it, as the core here is absolutely fantastic. But with that, we come to the close of this video, but I'm curious, what did you guys think of Amnesia the Bunker? Let me know in the comments below, and if you made it this far in the video, be sure to give it a like, and if you want more content like this, be sure to subscribe as well. We're getting back into Silent Hill for the next video, but I played this over the Halloween season and I was so smitten with it that I felt compelled to just talk and make a video about it. Plus, I was in the mood for something more modern as I'm also being a little selfish here. If you're interested in more content like this, check out the backlog of videos and consider becoming a member as everything I make off of this channel goes right back into it. Thank you all for your time today and until next time, my name is Brendan and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.